Hello, family. Today's episode is brought to you by 5 and 7 Tactical Solutions. They are the premier services for self-defense training, law enforcement officers who want to get certified or recertified. Whether you need to get uh, training for long guns or pistol safety courses, depending on what state you're in. In the state of Hawaii, they offer certifications for Hawaii and also in Arizona. So if you need to guard car training, I actually got my pistol safety courses and certified in the state of Hawaii. I am working on getting, uh, you know, my CCW uh, in two different states. I'm, that's my plan anyway. Go to uh, 5 and 7 Tactical Solutions LOC.com. If that's something that interests you, I always say we, we obviously support law enforcement, but there are some situations that you don't want to be caught in a situation where you're not prepared, you're not ready. And they also offer services for people that are not interested in firearms. I'm personally a very firm supporter of the Second Amendment, but I'm also a very firm supporter of people that want to just protect themselves. So they also offer services where you can do unarmed self-defense tactics. And for those that know, there's a great story and we'll share it probably in our broadcast. Um, they also offer quite a bit of just courses for men and women. If you're a parent and you want your daughter or your, your kids to learn some basic like in-vehicle um, self-defense training and all that good stuff, go to 5 and 7 tactical Solutions LLC.com. That's my very good friend, but a David Padilla. And uh, if you're interested in any of the packages that they have to offer, use my promo code GLO, GLO, and they'll give you $25 off of any package that you desire. That's 5 and 7 Tactical Solutions LLC.com. And that's it. Yeah. So, family, thank you for being here. Uh, I got a special guest. This is kind of impromptu. We've been talking about it, but we got a very special guest out there in Mesquite, Texas. He is a live streaming extraordinaire. He's also, um, he's trademarked himself, which is really got, got my attention. Uh, it, it's a cool thing. And I, we talked about that. And we're going to just sit down and talk story. I, met this gentleman uh, virtually on a platform called Periscope, which is an app that Twitter had purchased for $120 million back in 2015. A lot of you guys know that story. He was one of the broadcasters that would very consistently put out content and just share his heart. He's a fellow believer. I uh, love the guy. We just got through praying before we got started. And I, I said, man, if we're going to have, we're going to do this, that's just like, let God be the center of everything that we talk about. And and I'm hoping that this encourages you guys. I'm excited to have him. Ladies and gentlemen, a very dear friend of mine, brother, the Kyle Mack. Let me get my video ready. We're going to get started in about 48 seconds. Do me a favor, repost this, reshare it out. We are live on YouTube, Twitch, Rumble, Kick, and of course, here on X. My name is Brother Greg. If you don't know already, we'll see you in 48 seconds. I seen you playing drums over there. <laughs> What's up, man? I can't help it, man. That was a nice little group put down, man. You, you like that picture? It also pretty like, oh, who's this sexy guy with the green eyes, man? man what's up with that, right? <laughs> what's up with that? Yeah, yeah. I didn't. How you been? I mean, I, I didn't know you played bass. Yeah, I played bass since I was twelve years old or so. Started a guitar at about probably ten or eleven. And then it was just a natural transition over to, to bass and then play a little bit of drums, but I can't play the piano to save my life. That's, I don't know why. I, I, I think it's just impatience. You know what I mean? If I sit down and I really concentrated and really put the work, the grind into it, I could, but you know, I've always sit down and, and kind of just went, Oh man, forget it. You know, cause the other just came naturally to me. I don't know why it just, it just did. So uh, how many bases do you have? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I have at least six that are 
functional that actually work. Uh, and then I have several that I've kind of Frankenstein, meaning that I've taken pickups out of, or I've taken the bridge from, or I've, I've took a, uh, you know, some tuning pegs off of and stuff like that. So I have a lot of uh, that are kind of just pushed around. I have a few that uh, someone sent me one one time to test out uh, that was a hollow base. Oof. which meaning it, it just had the outline it didn't have the actual body to it uh and it it, it wasn't really that great you know so <laughs> i i just kind of put that to the side and uh, uh don't really mess with it anymore but yeah about about five to six that i can think of right now that are that are operational but i have my my baby my favorite one that i i play all the time so, so what's your weapon of choice what is your primary weapon uh bass I would say base. Uh, to me, there's just something about you know when you're a guitar player, you can go off on your own. You can you can play. You're still in the band. You but you've got your solos and you've got your your time to be able to put your licks in. You can stop playing for a little bit. When you're playing the bass, you really can't stop playing. Right. Uh, and then you also have some there's always a connection with the drummer because the bass and the drummer is that groove right the bass and the drummer is the, is the person that locks that beat in the one that you hear first uh the thing that gets you out on the dance floor so to speak and so i i love playing bass and i love being able to play with drummers that i enjoy my brother is probably my favorite one uh and the best one uh you know that to play with uh and it's just it's great to be able to lock in with somebody feel that groove and to fall in the pocket of it and just play you know but i enjoy playing guitar and and you know drums occasionally so so we have uh i think it's a p bass okay yeah and uh, i think we mm -hmm. uh we've at this house we have Five five guitars. My daughter has a Fender bass, mm -hmm. and then we have one, two, three, three ukuleles here, and we have three, four ukuleles back home. Right. And then actually, I have, I have another guitar back in Hawaii. I have a carbon carbon fiber acoustic. I think it's called Carbon Acoustics. They make uh, okay. car carbon fiber bought in beautiful guitar. Yeah. Real thin because it's carbon fiber, and it's a right. small body acoustic. And it's got the sound hole at the top versus the middle. It's, really? Yeah, it's a very unique sound. Uh, it's wow. I think it was like seven, seven, seventeen hundred. It wasn't too bad. Sometimes those carbon fibers can be upwards of two grand or more. You know, so yeah, yeah, they can get pricey. They can get real pricey fast. But I'll have to. I've never tried one though. I'll definitely have to try one with the sound hole at the top. Uh, that's very interesting to think about. That I, I bet it gives off a unique sound to it. So. It's unusually warm for a carbon fiber instrument. Usually, really? yeah, usually plastic type instruments are very um, more the high end. Yeah, it's actually got a nice warmth to it. It's weird. It, if you're an EQ guy or a sound guy, it's got a lot of yeah. the uh, what's the word? It's got a lot of low end frequencies, right. but it doesn't have a lot of punch. If that makes any yeah, sense, right? Definitely, yeah. I actually started out doing sound before I actually picked up an instrument. Believe it or not, it being as young as I was, uh, my whole family had a had a group, and and so I would, you know, run sound for them, and then later on at church, uh, I would do that there. So uh, I know exactly what you mean by low end, high end, all that kind of stuff. So. Now, you know I, I play bass, right? I, I didn't know that. I'll show you a video so, uh, once we get rolling. Uh, I, I okay. love playing funk. Like, that's my thing. Uh, gotcha. I'm not... Who, go ahead. Who's your who's your, who's your your man? Who's, who's your guy? Who's your uh, influencer? On you know, anything James Brown. Uh, you know, Bootsy, oh, Coll okay. Bootsy Collins. Um, yes. I admire... Um, Victor Wooten and Jaco Pistorius, I I, sure. I admire them, but it doesn't make me want to groove. Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing, I, I, just melodically. 
um i i don't listen to secular music really uh, i try not to and sure. i mean I, i'm not uh sacrilegious or super religious where if there's a song yeah. that gets me to fall in love with my wife and it's for the most part not telling me to fornicate and it's a good right. rhythm song I'll, I'll listen to it and you know like um old school like Motown music but um yeah one of my indulgences that i i don't listen to anymore i love flea you know um man yeah man what he, yeah and then for sure i don't listen to them anymore but um uh, th- those they were they were like red hot chili peppers on steroids ah oh, what was their name um uh, they had a song with called winona's you know oh, what was it um shoot it, it'll come to me but really funky band really perverted lyrics that's the only drawback to them um yeah, yeah, yeah. primus yeah oh Pri- uh, yeah 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 yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's, what's, what's the dude's name i'm thinking of somebody i think getty lee i think that's oh, somebody else but i'm gonna uh, i can ask google right hey google who was the bass player for primus Les Claypool. Les Claypool. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah, I can't. I, I really, I, I've heard his stuff over the years. I really just can't get into that type of music. I'm, I'm more of a Motown. Oh, okay. Uh, so my, my, uh, big guy that I liked was James Jamerson. And he's the guy that played on all the Jackson fives, Stevie wonder, um, uh, all the old, you know, Marvin Gaye. He's the one that's got, uh, that's, that plays on let's get it on. And, and all those great grooving songs. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course you cannot forget Larry Graham and Graham central station, you know? Oh, uh, He's a fellow believer, man. He's got some Christian songs out, and uh, I don't mean to just playing around. He he he's he's the funk bass. He was the first person to ever actually slap funk, slap a bass, like literally slap and pop a string on the bass on a recording. So he's kind of the godfather of funk. So uh, a little bit of tidbit of a fact there. So uh, Philip Bailey, I, I enjoy some of his playing yes. uh from earth wind and fire um, yes nathan east you ever, you ever listen to nathan east who, who is he um with? i want to say four play the jazz band i think okay but he he's yeah. no, uh he's a black dude but he's known because his bass he has a mic attached to his bass it's a okay it's a skinny little mic but uh yeah yeah i have a buddy uh and uh you might know his name. His name is Alex uh, Alex Ramirez. Uh, Alex, I'm sorry, Alex Moran, and he does all the studio work for. He was in uh, De La Holas Trio. Okay, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, this and they did the song Heaven. If you remember that song from about 20 years ago or so, and uh, but he does all of Darling, like Darling Sheck's uh, oh, bass stuff yeah. and. He's the one that did the the like the opening line to uh, "You Are Good," where he slapped the you know slaps the bass at the, at the very beginning to start the whole song off. And uh, I met him through my church, and he's just a he, he's an awesome guy. He he back then he was a young gun, he was a young kid, but he was really cool. And we got a chance to sit back back in the back and just kind of trade off bases and and you know share licks and stuff like that and. Uh, if you got a second, I, I'll tell you a little funny story about that, though. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. So uh, the praise and worship leader is is uh, was my brother-in-law, and he called me up, and he said, man, you have to come tonight to meet this guy and hear him play. Uh, his name is Alex Moran, and he, you know, and he told me. Uh, and he said, but I have a funny story for you. He said, uh, he said, our ba- he, he said, they came in for sound check a little bit earlier. And he said, our bass player for the church, who's in a, a big band himself, but he was there and he was kind of messing around and playing with his, his bass. And uh, he's a good buddy of mine. His name is Dwayne Hagar. And Dwayne was playing with this bass. And, and uh, so Alex walks up to him and, and says, hey, man, I, I really like the bass you have. 
um, is there anybody that you admire? And he said, yeah, there's just one kid out there. He's really great, man. His name is uh, Alex Moran. And he goes, uh, so Alex looks at him and says, uh, I-, I am Alex Moran. He goes, no, 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 man. I mean, I'm not saying you're Alex Moran. I'm saying I, I really like Alex Moran. You know what I'm talking about, Darling Sheck? And he goes, no, 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 no. I am Alex Moran. <laughs> and it was him. And he was just like, oh, my God. I, and, and so now, to this day, we still kid him about that. It's like, man... You you did you were face to face with the guy. I told him that you were his you know idol or whatever, and and man, that that I laughed so hard when when I uh, he told me that, and he gets embarrassed over that completely. So it embarrassed him a little bit more, but yeah yeah, Alex Moran's no, I am no 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 yes I am Alex Moran you know type of thing. So I, I found that to be quite funny. That crew that Darlene Check had. You know, in the late eighties, it's muted now. Oh, <laughs> that 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 um that crew that Darlene Check had back in the late eighties, early nineties, yeah. they it. were so professional in their sound and very clean, right? Yes, um, yes. I, I didn't like the mix in terms of the 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 drums per se. Like the the newer mixes right. today are a lot better, but just the. The guitar player that that ran with them, I think he was from Air Supply. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, just and, and before I share my story, I'm not sure if Seb is still in here, but he was. He he said hello. Let me see if he's still in here. But it's I can't good. see the chat. So um, there's pr- probably a button. Uh, you can nav- try to navigate while I'm talking. But brother Seb okay. is in here, and uh, Ginger and Gail Webb, thank you for jumping in. And those of you on the web yeah. viewers. Um, for anybody that's uh, on uh, the other socials where YouTube, Twitch, Rumble, Kick, thank mm-hmm. you for being here. Just as a friendly reminder for anybody that wants to go live, um, don't worry about the total viewers or who's in there or not. Just remember there are people that can watch from the outside and it may not show in your uh, running total. So just keep that in mind. Just keep doing it. Keep going live. Keep talking. Keep sharing your heart. But here's the story. Um we played at uh, the church I was with at the time. We played at this, um, I can't remember what it was. It was some kind of prayer fest, but we played at the Aloha Stadium in Hawaii. So the Aloha Stadium is where the NFL plays their Pro Bowl, or they used to play their Pro Bowl every year. Oh, okay. Uh, and that stadium holds uh, full capacity, I would say 45,000, maybe 50,000. Wow. But we played uh, for some kind of prayer conference, and so... Uh, it it wasn't full, but I think there was at that time maybe twenty thousand people there. It was it was obviously like half full, so around twenty thousand. And so yeah. we we went out to play, and I I play everything. I love playing drums, bass, guitar, piano. I, I play it all just out of necessity. I had to learn how to. Uh, so anyways, that day I played bass. Yeah, and, and so I don't own a five string. Uh, I I can play it if I'm messing around. But that day we went up, we did a few songs. And the bass that they had up on stage, I didn't have my own bass. So I grabbed the bass and I, as soon as I strap strap in, plug in, I'm like, I look at my um one of my friends, I said, What is this? He said, it's a bass. I said, No, there's a there's a fat string on the top. And it's got five strings. And I kind of <laughs> knew, but I'm like, I was I was nervous. And I he right. said, Don't worry about it, you got it. And one thing I will say that I've been blessed, I, I may not know a lot of runs or a lot of uh, scales or things like that, sure. but I know how to groove. And yes. I, I got a good, like, you know, I, I can go back and forth behind the one, but I know how to always land on the one. I always hope you, hey, if I yeah. slow fast, I know how to get back on the one. Yes. Well, bro, my groove was like on point. I was jamming. You know what I mean? Like, ding, 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 right? And You're right, right, right. At the end of the song, I'm like, bro, my heart was on the floor because the groove I was playing that I was jamming was for a four string. (laughs) I was playing the B string. Yeah, right. And they were all wrong. They were the wrong notes. But (laughs) because it was in a big stadium. There's these huge, like there are these, you know, there's sub, there's there's like a whole row. Yeah. So it felt amazing to me. Bro, I'm, yeah. I'm jamming. Boom, tch, 
and I'm like, at the end, I'm like, oh no, oh my god, I played the wrong chords. I'm like, <laughs> and I don't even know if yeah. anybody even knew on stage, but I know if I was in a crowd, I'd be like, bro, this bass player is whack. He's <laughs> playing all the wrong chords, you know. So, oh man, hey, but it felt I've good. Had I, I have I've done some really uh, some crazy things like that too. I have literally spent thirty minutes before going. I, why is it hollering at the sound? Man, why is this not working? And then figured out. Oh, I have to plug it in down. <laughs> you know, like oh man, I thought that was the first thing I did. You know, it's like oh that is that's funny though. I, I like I, I teach music too, and so. Whenever somebody says, well, you know, pull out your guitar, your bass, and, and you know, show us something or whatever, I, you know, I, I'll always go, yeah, man, I, you know, I, I do it, you know, professionally for a living. And uh, anyway, so let's start. So this is, this, this is the G, the, the F string, <laughs> the Z, Z string. No, no, this is the, and I always mess with everybody and they're going, thinking, is this guy, like nuts or what and, and i'll then i'll start off with something you know and kind of give them a taste of what i know and and go listen i'm just kidding i know i know the order and the sequence so you know but uh it, it's a lot of fun and i i love being musical and i believe it's a great expression and i i can't tell you how many times that you know even though i have been out and ventured into the the club and the bar scene which is not my favorite but i can tell you that i you know I, my brother is not with us anymore my both of my brothers but uh some of the greatest times of my life and the times i wish i could have went could go back to or revisit or anything were times were playing bass in church mm. you know and just playing playing for god and 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 praise and worship and stuff like that and just you know i i I miss it and uh, I miss them and, and all that. But like I said, you know, some of the best times that I've had have, have been at uh, playing for praise and worship in church. So I understand and completely uh, get you, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge cover person unless I have to learn that cover. You know, uh, I don't sit around all the time and, and just basically pick stuff. So, you know. I just kind of do it when I can. You know, my uh, I played with my brother's band, and uh, we played in Waikiki. Um, and you know, Waikiki is so. This bar that we played at, it was kind of like a grilling bar. That's kind of how everything is in Hawaii. It's a you know a big restaurant, but they have a bar, and so a lot of tourists, obviously, and we were a Hawaiian band, but also top 40 just because people tip. So people yeah, tip yeah. with, you know, they're in right. Hawaii and we have a few token, you know, Hawaii songs. And one of the things my brother, and he joked about it, they're like, okay, we'll take your request, but anything Taylor Swift is going to cost you a hundred dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> once in right. a while, once in a while, somebody would tip a hundred bucks because they want to hear a Taylor Swift song or Miley Cyrus wrecking ball. You know, right, right, and right. um, but there are times where I could because I was working, you know, I had, I had a day job and we would show up in Waikiki. Uh, so I'd be there at 435. So it's sunset and the sun is beating yeah. down on me and I had to set up my drums. So I was playing yeah. drums at the time and I'm, I'm just I'm tired. Right. And um, I don't know if you know this, but my wife and I are pastors. We're paralegals, but we're not. Yes we're not so religious to where we ignore scripture and all those things. And sure. I'm a firm believer that, um, like for, first of all, getting drunk, it's obviously a sin and I don't drink anymore, but I would have like a, a drink here, uh, here, but never in public. It was primarily at home with my wife and something right. that we would enjoy. Um, I don't do it anymore because I think I'm allergic now. So I, I get itchy. <laughs> <laughs> it turns super right. Wet. But at that time, you know, I had one drink and I, I get pretty warm and fuzzy already. And I, I was getting sleepy. And I remember just sitting through a lot of those sets, you know, playing, you know, cover covers, uh, covers. And I'm like, I, I don't even remember half the songs because it's like an autopilot because we play them so much. 
And yes. I literally, and I look at my friend who's a bass player, my very good friend. He's sleeping. He's like literally playing, the, <laughs> you know, and it's right. like, I, I'm, yeah. I, I agree with you. I'm not a big, big fan of covers, but that's kind of paying, right. paying your dues, I guess. You know, you pay your dues in the beginning, you know. It is. And you're always <laughs> going to get somebody that shouts free bird or, <laughs> you know, Sweet Hotel Home California. Alabama. Yeah. yeah, Hotel California, you know, Desperado and things. And Desperado. Just, oh, God. Come oh. on, man. Let's, you know, let's just get past it, you know? <laughs> so, family, but, uh, for those that don't know, me and Kyle were talking in the beginning, and he just finished going live on, on TikTok. So, this is the first time we've been live together ever, right? I think. we never Right. Been, um, so, tell everybody that's watching like where were you for the past couple years on x were you in the shadows like what what's your story oh i think he kicked himself out so we'll, we'll let him reset his connection but for those that don't know kyle um uh, he used to broadcast a lot and he just told me before uh we went live that he has i think four thousand uh followers four thousand plus followers on tiktok i i only have like 580 so what's up brother bruce good to see you uh bruce goodman thank you brother for jumping in on x on twitter but uh he has like over four thousand. I, I don't know if i follow him. there he is we'll bring him back up <laughs> there you go i'm sorry but man i i, I it put an alert up and I, and I switched over and i hit the wrong button and it kicked me off i, I apologize it's all good what was the last question you asked me i i, I was gonna we we were we were talking about where in the heck were you in the past couple of years on Twitter now X. So man, the last two years you talked. It's funny you talked about seasons earlier. And you talked about different things and and all the the things that we go through. And you know, I, I started out uh, about four years ago. I there was a small knot on my left bicep. And they did a surgery on it. They messed the surgery up on that, and it left a, a scar. Well, it healed up. It took a long time. I had to go in the hospital for a while, and I got really sick with that. Um, but it finally healed up and scarred over. And it kind of gave me trouble off and on, but about two, two and a half years ago or so, it flared up. And I went and saw several doctors about it, and they told me, don't worry about it. It's all right. It's just normal And until I got sick. And so uh, I literally physically got sick and had to be rushed to the hospital, and they opened up, and it had uh, been infected. So they went in and did a really big operation on it where they did a diamond cut, which is basically cutting half of your bicep. And then it grows back together. And that that takes six to seven months just to do on its own. Uh, and I, it would never heal completely up. It would heal up to the size of a, of a like a uh, eraser on the end of a pencil. And then it would leak. And uh, it's gross, but it's just the truth. And so I would go to another surgeon and they would reopen it, clean it. And then it'd have to grow back together. And that would be another six to seven months. And so finally, I went to a, um, and we, it took me forever, but I found a uh, person that does reconstruction and plastic surgery. And he said, you know, I don't really suspect that there's something bad uh, because I'd had another doctor that had told me, man, you, have, you might have cancer. Uh, I might have to cut your arm off. Uh, I might have, I mean, it just scared me to death with no diligence or anything new due diligence on this at all. And the thing about it is, is that I finally went to the plastic surgeon and he said, look, here, I'm going to take you in and I'm going to get this, you know, fixed for, for good. But I don't think I'm going to have to do much. I think what I'm going to do is, is when I get you in the operating room, we're going to drop some blue dye down in that hole. We're going to see just, you know, what's going on. Then I, it'll probably take about 20 minutes and then I'll just kind of sew your arm up and that way it'll be all good. And so, you know, I went in you know, thinking 20 minute operation, no big deal. And came out two and a half hours later and even though they had done all kind of tests on it 
when he got in there, my bicep had been eaten all the way up. And so he had to literally, my bicep was flat and infected. So he had to go in, he had to put all kind of uh, like uh, uh, like liquids and antibiotic and all this powder and all this stuff. And then he had to take, which is crazy to think about, is he stitched four layers up of my bicep. So he stitched it from the bottom to the middle, to the top, and then to the very top of my arm to finally get that. Uh, and it took him two and a half hours. He was shocked that nobody had caught it before. And after that, I caught an infection again with that, but it stayed uh, it stayed local. It didn't you know get in my blood this time. And after a, a round of antibiotics and having a pick line and all that, mm. you know, crazy mm. stuff, I ended up getting uh, over it. And so it's so far so good. It, it, it's pretty much closed up now and it, it's not giving me any trouble. Thank God. Uh, but that's what's pretty much every time that I would tell. And I know like my Paramac family that's here, like Miss Gail and, and uh, Dave and some of the others that are watching that have been with me for a while. I know they probably thought and were very frustrated because I would come on and go, hey, guys, I promise after this surgery, I'm coming back on. I will be back. And then, you know, as soon as that and they'd go, you got to have another surgery and I'd just be it just lay me out, man, to be honest. And I would just be depressed. And, and and I was, you know, it was to the point where it was hard enough for me to motivate myself to be positive. I knew that I couldn't get on, you know, X or Twitter or wherever mm -hmm. and motivate anybody else because I just didn't have that in me at all. Right. So, you know, and I'm not one of those people that's going to fake it to make it. You know what I mean? So that's why i'm just that's why i'm now entering back into that whole thing of you know getting on x and doing the lives and visiting over at TikTok and seeing kind of what they're about what their setup is uh even though i do enjoy twitter live better mm -hmm. but um but yeah that so that's kind of been my my journey uh you know i lost my brother during uh covid uh, and I've lost two brothers and, and actually my dad passed away two weeks after my oldest brother passed away. So a lot of that was, you know, going on at the same time as the surgeries were happening and things like that. And so, like I said, I'm just now back to the point where I'm able to, to, to commit to go live and to be able to do what I need to do and what I feel, you know, God has led me to do. And, and that's to come on and encourage people you know well i'll and say this do it you know uh bro you've been through hell <laughs> you know it, it it's felt like it man well, it's felt like it. you know it, man it's it, that, that's such a heavy hammer to drop but i will say this um man god's got you here right now for a very specific reason you know and believe it you know, um, I will say we got to do more of these. I'm telling you that right now. But there's people that need to hear yeah. a, a victorious story. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, um, well, first of all, but my heart goes out to you. And, you know, sorry to hear about your dad and your brother. My brother sure. uh, in 2021. So he got mm -hmm. COVID in, in September of 2021. Yes. He he got better but about a month later uh about a month later he uh my 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 dad calls my wife i'm, I'm in hawaii yeah my dad t tells my wife that my brother's on the floor huh mm -hmm. oh actually he he calls basically he calls the wrong people he calls my auntie then then i call my dad my dad's in shock because my dad had COVID. Um, he had a harder time fighting it. Yeah. So I call 911 in Oregon from Hawaii. And I tell them, can you get to my brother's house? Fortunately, the hospital is literally one street over from my brother's house. Yeah. They rush him there. 
uh, I got on a plane. I got on a plane literally the next morning, or I think it was the next morning. So I'm there. I'm there within less than 24 hours. I'm in Oregon. I think the longest that my brother was in on the floor was three days. Cause I think, you know, after three days, you probably would have been dead already. So, uh, he's been bedridden ever since he had seven strokes, um, full, he, he was intubated. Um, he had, um, what's the other word? Um, he, he's got a, uh, trach and a peg. And just picking a pick, yeah. And then just recently, we had to do a colo- col- how you say it, hun? Colonoscopy, colonoscopy bag. What basically the colonoscopy. bag? Colonoscopy. Yes, yes. He's fully coherent mentally. He just doesn't have the physical function to move his whole body, um, right? And his vocal cord. Now he's very aware and very much so active in decision making. So if we ask him, you know, make, to make a decision, he's like yes, no. Or he'll nod his head. Yes. And uh, that that season of the world, that whole COVID thing was crazy. And my, you know, my yes. brother got COVID from a, a co-worker, a co-worker who was vaccinated. And so nobody, wow. everybody didn't know. There's so much fear surrounding that time, you know. And Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fortunately, his employer, um, and I don't know what, what the protocol was, but they took responsibility just because it was at the workplace. Um, he when he got COVID, yeah. So they covered, you know, medical expenses, which was thank God because it's man. And you know, man, I, I give you credit, yeah. but hospital bills ain't cheap. It's a business, oh, right? You ain't lying, man. <laughs> they will, they will literally run you through the cleaners, man. If they yeah. can, yeah, yeah, man, yeah. I, you know, I I can I can. I'm I'm at the stage where I'm still trying to get my physical body back because I had so much time literally laying in a bed or uh, not being able to be act, out and active because of my arm. Because literally, you know, I when it, when you say that your bicep is destroyed, that means from your elbow to your shoulder. So, you know, I have a scar. It's not pretty, but it's literally, there's a scar that goes all the way down where they literally just opened my arm up, you know. And at one time they talked about just taking it. It might just, you know, we might just have to take your arm. And that was, you know, that was one of the scariest things was, was a doctor looks at you and says, you know, hey, I want you to sign these papers before we go in because I just might have to take your arm off. And then you, and at that you're a musician and you're going, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're going to, you're going to do what now? You know what I mean? You, you know, or you might lose functionality in, in, in your arm or something. And it's a very scary thing. So, and, and I, my heart and prayers go out to you and your family and your brother and, and uh, man, you know, just keep, if I could give you some advice, keep encouraging him. I know it's depressing. I know it's it's hard and downtrodding, and I, and I know, but I'm sure, man, I'm sure that he really appreciates you guys and and really appreciates help all the help that you give because I've seen some of the videos that you put out and some of the things you talked about with him and and man, you're a, a wonderful guy for for being there for your brother. Well. I appreciate that. And I got to ask you that. So officially what you went through, was it a blood infection? Is that what it was? So what would happen is, is that the, the bicep would get staff. Okay. So that staff would get into my bloodstream. And so once it gets in your bloodstream, you only have a, a, a short amount of time before that hits your system and basically shocks you or stops your heart. Um, the last time that I had it, by the time that I got to the hospital, which was 30 minutes, uh, between the time that I took my temperature and started kind of feeling cold chills and feeling bad, I took my temperature, it was 90, 98.7 
and then it dropped to, then it jumped to 100 and by the time i got to the hospital 20 minutes or so later uh it was at 104.5 hmm. so uh literally i could have lost my life they just stuck an iv in and started just taking bags of antibiotics and squeezing them uh into me just to get the you know that out of my system and uh i can't you know uh, uh, i can tell you i i had very deep conversations during this whole time <laughs> very deep conversations with god you know <laughs> so, very deep com you know sometimes they wasn't very nice I i'm gonna be honest with you greg yeah. it, you know it, it sometimes i you know i had the pity trip going on of why me why now why this why you know why you know why am i having to to deal with this or why can't this just you know so it, it's one of those things where you know what else what else are you gonna do you know and I heard a very good message one Sunday that kind of turned my mindset around from the late, great Charles Stanley. Um, he basically talked about Christ when he, when he went on on that Friday, he was the victim. Uh, you know, he was the one that everybody wanted to see and he, he probably felt like the victim. Uh, but when he rose on that third day, mm. he was the victor. You know, and he went through that victory. Uh, so even though he had to go through some, you know, some of the worst pain, and suffering, and and all of that 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 we all know, uh, and that we've never really experienced uh, truly like he did, but he came from being a victim to a victor, and uh, you know, now we know that he's alive and 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 well and doing, uh, you know, it, he's at the right hand of the Father doing intercession for you and I did, everybody else did you ever have that dark discussion like um like just giving up you ever had did you ever have those discussions with the Lord I you know what I I had during that time I had a lot of frustrated moments where I I, I said I wanted to give up, but I didn't truly want to. It was more out of frustration. But if, you know, mm -hmm. but if someone would have given me the option, I, I wouldn't have really done it. I, I'd have stuck to it. I can tell you, though, that I have been in that position before uh, when my brother passed away. Mm. Uh, and I shared this the other night on, on uh, X on a live was, you know, I can remember times where, you know, there's a really big bridge that goes over in Dallas and it goes like three stories up. It, it goes over several different highways and you have to drive up it and it goes way up and, and, and it curves to the left. And uh, I can remember being so grief struck and, and so, you know, full of grief that I, that literally what went through my mind was this, you know, all you got to do is turn that wheel to the right. You'll go right off that bridge and man, you know, you won't be here any longer. And there was a few times that I thought, you know, that that is an easy, easy thing to do. That, that could happen. But every time I'm thankful that God reminded me of the pain that I went through, uh, to not put anybody else, me, my mother, my other brother, and my family through that kind of pain uh, of losing someone else in the family. Uh, and so that's what kept me through those times is, is knowing that, that, you know, whether I understand or whether I agree and, and of course you always want them back with you, uh, you know, I have tried to deal with accepting why that they were taken, you know what I mean? Because literally my brother was uh, my age when he passed away. My, my second to oldest brother was my age. And then my oldest brother was only 10 years older. So, uh, 
but yeah, I, I, I've, I've had those dark places and I can literally say my faith has kept me through those, you know, how many, but, how many brothers do you have? So I have three older brothers and my oldest two, uh, are, have gone on to be with the Lord. And my dad, um, has, he passed away, uh, 11 days after my oldest brother and uh so you know i've seen some seen some oh a lot of grief and, and woes i guess you'd say you know and uh, but you know god can still be trusted that that's one of the great things that's that, good that, that billy graham so let me let me give you a little little story if you don't mind yeah go ahead it's when billy graham he did the Billy Graham is my all-time favorite uh, uh, preacher. So um, he did the eulogy for 9-11 back when all that happened. And he stepped up to the podium and he said, I don't know why that God allowed this to happen. I don't know why that God allowed innocent people to die. I don't know why that God allowed a tragedy. I don't know why that God allowed for kids or people or or whatever to happen. I don't know why that that he did these things and and these things occurred. But what I do know is that God can still be trusted. He can still be trusted that he's there for you. You can still be trusted that he loves you. You can still be trusted that he's going to look out for your best interest. And I think that encouraged me uh, probably the most is knowing that no matter what we go through, as hard as it is, and in that moment when you don't have that mindset, it, it's it's – to me, it's a comfort to know that God is still with you and he can still be trusted that he hasn't given up on you yet, you know, and I, I'm living proof that, you know, I didn't think I was going to get my arm back and, and I, you know, I have good functionality with it now. So, you know, that that's kind of where I, I stand at is that God can still be trusted, you know. I went to his house in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um beautiful property oh yeah um he is by far i will say in my memory the only preacher man of god that there was no scandal attached to him now i may be wrong but i'm pretty sure he he's had no scandal attached to him um (laughs) Not the, he, he he said something one time that and and he's written he wrote in books about it and and when the early 80s came around he said he was you know under the influence of other pastors and and got in this movement of people telling him that uh, AIDS was the gay uh, mm-hmm. was a gay plague from God and he said, I'd said that one night in a, in a meeting, and he said, the minute that it came out of my mouth, he said, God chastised me. God got me and said, you you better go back and correct that. And so he went right back and said, that's not true. God did not. Is God is not afflicting people that are homosexual with AIDS because it's a plague, and he's doing that because he's punishing them, or that's not a punishment or anything like that. Uh, and so for years, he's kind of, he, he fought that battle of, uh, you know, that was something that I misspoke in immaturity, you know, but mm-hmm. my goodness, if, you know, he was almost a hundred, I believe when he died. Yeah. And, if, and if, <laughs> if that's the worst that you're going to say, you know, and that's the worst kind of scandal that you get into, geez, I think I'd take it. You know what I mean? Like, the, you know. But you Just said it. Up. You said it. It was maturity, uh, yeah. and, and then really that's that's old. That's old. Well, how should I put it? It's, it's like old theology out of Levitical law, where they ask you yeah. to believe, right? Where if you were sick, you must be <laughs> living yeah. in sin. You uh, did something. Yeah, you did exactly. You did. You did something. Uh, yeah. 
But man, I, I, I'll tell you this, man. There is just you and I talking. There are some really exciting things that God put in my heart uh, over the past couple of weeks. And I think with what you're sharing, um, there's so many victorious stories that are going to sprout from this conversation and what you're sharing with me. I got to ask this though, is, was there anything pre-existing that gave you an indication of what you got or is it just like out of the blue? It was, it was out of the blue. Um, It, I mean, literally I, I had a, my arm just started hurting so I went to a little doc in the box, just a little, like a little clinic. And they said, you know, they did a sonogram. They said, looks like there's a little bit of fluid that's collected about a size of a quarter. And so, you know, we don't really know what the fluid is. We think it just might be a buildup of, of you know, uh, just fluid, uh, but nothing to worry about. We don't think it's infection, nothing like that. So what we want to do is we're going to transfer you to the big hospital through an ambulance. And then what we'll do is we're not going to do surgery. Don't worry about that. Uh, We're just going to take a needle and aspirate it, which means they're just going to take a needle, go down in there, suck the fluid out. And that that's it. It's kind of like getting a shot. It's the reverse. And I said, well, okay, that that's easy enough. And so by the time that I got to the hospital, they were willing me into a surgery room and going, no, I think we need to go ahead and open that up and we need to cut you open and not, you know, as you said a while ago, bro, the hospitals will take you out if they can. And literally they did this big surgery, went in there and found there was no infection and that it was just fluid. And by them doing the surgery, it made me susceptible to staff and I got staff and I ended up being in the hospital for weeks at a time uh, after that. So the surgery was not a success. And then they left uh, just just crazy things. They left, uh, uh, they did a bad surgery on it. And that's where it kind of started, kicked off. And that was four and a half years ago. So, like I said, it, it, there was no pre existing thing to it you know i i could work out i could i could do whatever and my arm was not affected and it never had any problems with it before you know i uh i I have a history of you know i'm 48 so i'm willing to be on very very honest about it but at the time you know i i got involved well i first started doing pro hormones i used to be very into bodybuilding and the profile picture I have now is evidence of what I desired, right? What I, and I'm going to change my profile picture soon. I'm going to do a whole rebranding. And, but there was a time when I went through, uh, per hormones, which were basically oral steroids. Yes. And when I found out that taking oral steroids, you can get the results that you want physically, um, and, and great workouts, but you're, you're taxing your liver. Yes. So I, I I migrated from, you know, oral steroids to what we call the oils or the injectables where I would, you know, get a needle and use the, the steroids and inject it. Um, yes. Ironically, to this day. Yeah. I am so terrified of needles, brother. <laughs> Unbelievably. Yeah. Like, even, I, even if you can't, I cannot handle from when right. I was a kid. I remember I used to have really bad asthma and I would have to get shots every week and I was so scared. And that's why yeah. I have this fear of needles. Yes. But I, I somehow I managed to over, I didn't actually overcome the fear. I, I struggled and I wanted this physique. I wanted this body. I wanted to look, right. uh, it's not addictive in the sense of chemically, like how like a illicit drug is, but the yeah. addiction came from wanting to, to be validated, wanted yeah. to have this certain look. I, you know, I wanted to, and I, I blanketed it all. I, I covered it all in. I want to be a good steward of my body. I'm going to, you know, puff up this temple of the Lord and make it look, you know, like big buff. Right. Like Arnold, you know, we're going to work harder. But really, yeah. I, really, I, I was taking drugs, right? And I was, right. I was sure. shooting my, my rear end and I would shoot up on my, my thighs. Yes. And... 
I do know now that if ever, if I didn't stop early enough, I would be setting myself up for mystery illnesses or mystery things that, you know, where there's heart issues or, you know, just guys that abuse steroids. I didn't abuse it because I used it. You know, I'm not condoning it, but I didn't abuse steroids at all. I, I, I did it very clean, um, you know, and so, but I, I go to that point where, you know, I started having kids and I, I had that fear, like, and it, is this stuff that I'm taking going to affect me or my family for the generations? And right. am I going to live on this earth long enough to be able to see my kids, grandkids, great grandkids? And finally got to the point where, you know what? I, I don't need it anymore. And I, I gave it to the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm fine not having, you know, massive biceps. I'm, I'm fine not having big fat quads, you know, sure. and, I, I, I'm really excited. You know, we're sharing stories tonight that there's a word that God put in my heart right now in this conversation is uh, identity. That we have way too many men and women today that do not understand what a true and real identity is. That's right. Right. And we're looking for it in things that are not lasting. You know, it can be in notoriety and followers. It can be whatever. But if it's not in the Lord, it's very short lived you know oh yeah oh yeah yeah i mean i i I know somebody that went through pretty much uh, a similar situation as you is they they want they wanted to look like a wrestler they wanted to be (laughs) big you know they wanted to, to have that physique and so they turned to getting uh steroids and uh they uh, it started injecting, uh, and so they ended up getting big. And I mean, they would get on the treadmill and they could run two and a half hours at one point. I mean, I'd be on there and I'd barely be able to keep up 15 minutes, you know. And I finally I confronted them and said, you know, what is the what's what's really going on? And they, and they confided in me that you know, yeah, I'm taking some anabolics and stuff like that, and and. Then they went into kidney failure yeah. and they had to go to the hospital. And so they, and they said, you know what, if you don't get off them, you, you're going to die. And so they got off. And then a, a few years later, they said, well, you know, maybe, maybe wasn't the steroids. Maybe I can go back. And so they tried it again. And all of a sudden their kidneys failed again. And so they said, okay, I'm done. And this person said, you know, when I was on those steroids, I felt so good. And he said, there's people out there that will never be able to get off of them because it makes you feel so good because it, it makes you feel, uh, you know, so good. Like you said, you, to have an identity of someone looking mm-hmm. at you and going, wow. And that's what they wanted. You know what I mean? They wanted the, uh, the identity of, wow, you know, when somebody saw them and it just wasn't worth the good, the bad health though, you know? You know, Sarah, who was in here, I meant to acknowledge her earlier. Yeah. And I, let me read some comments. I'll put them up here. But Sarah was talking about needles and how, why are people so fearful? Brother Bruce, who's in here, that's uh, Bruce Goodman. And then we've got uh, Gregory Chemis in here. Hey, buddy. And then uh, Sarah brought up an interesting point about fear. You know, you talking about guys enjoying that, people looking at them a certain way. What what I'm finding is that a lot of times when we have this uh, false or short-lived image of ourselves that we're quote unquote addicted to, it really a lot of it is fear that maybe they won't like the real me. Yeah. Maybe they won't like who I really am, and that's why even that in itself, there's this uh, what is this? Uh, what's the terminology? There is this teaching going around. It's heavily here on X where that it's kind of my trigger words. Like one is just speak your truth. Everybody speak your truth. I'm like, no, no, no. First of all, if everybody speaks the truth, we're all a bunch of liars. <laughs> you know what I mean? So <laughs> right, right. there's only one truth, right? And that's yes. God's truth. And then the other one is um, right. everybody's looking into them, you know, just believe in yourself and then you you can do it. If you just look deep in the within and just rely right. on yourself, right. you, you'll make it. Well, 
No, because there are times when you fail yourself and there are times when you just don't have nothing left in the tank. Yes. Right? And so our our true identity and stability, it comes from the Lord. It comes from God saying, no, I know who you are. I created you. Yes. Right? And right. man, this is exciting. I, I, let me pop up some more comments. Gergi added another comment. Sure. I, he said, I used to talk to Kyle about some of my preferences due to the past hurts. I have identity issues too. You know, Man, re- respond to that, uh, Kyle. That's to you. Yeah, I, I, I've had many conversations with Gregory, and and uh, he's a great guy. And and you know what? He's just like everybody else. He goes through things, and he goes through his times of trials and troubles and everything else. And and you know, I just tried to to be there for him whenever he needs and. Like I said, I, I, I haven't been broadcasting, you know, the last few years. And so I haven't been able to keep up with people like I really want and desire to. But, you know, that's somebody that, you know, that I definitely have been through some ups and downs with as far as, you know, uh, I've been with him at some positive points and some, some negative points in his life. And it's great to hear from you, Greg. Well, you know, but... Uh, it's funny because like you he's were saying, saying Greg. I'm thinking, oh, he's talking to the other Gregory. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gregory. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Say Gregory, uh, but uh, I, I completely agree with you. Is that you know I think that's that's one of the many lies that that we buy into from society is that uh, you know we can do it on our own, and that's just not true, man. And I'm telling you because there's been times I thought you know, l- or let me say this, uh, you know. I, I, I talked to someone that I'm very close to uh, one time and they knew better. They, they grew up a believer and they said something to me and I, I immediately, it, as being older and more mature, I knew better, is they said this quote to me and they said, what's God ever done for me mm. that I haven't done for myself? And I said, you need to stop and sit back and and re- basically repent and say I don't mean that I'm just kidding because let me tell you you can't do enough to outdo God and if you were capable enough uh to be able to handle all the situations uh, without God and if it was you um you would be uh, in a in a very very bad place right now and i can promise you the people that say oh I, that will never happen to me you know what i found that probably about 75 percent of those people usually end up that happening to them whether it be drug addiction or alcoholism or womanizing or something like that so you know, I'll never, I'll never be on drugs. Something happens, they hurt their back, and then they're all of a sudden they're on painkiller. You, you know, just there's a million different you know scenarios I could throw. But relying upon yourself, there's one thing you know to believe in yourself. There's another thing to believe in that you are the end all be all of yourself. Right. You know, <clears throat> I, I I will say we got a schedule. Uh, I don't know if you have you ever done an audio spaces before here on uh, or on Twitter X. I've never hosted one, but I have been a moderator of one, and okay. I've, I've actually been in in a spaces. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan in a sense of how long they can go. Um, but I, I see the draw to it. But yeah. I, I think the conversations we're having, it would be good to have a, a group of people you know, do a Q&A yeah. style, you know, where we can audibly hear them. And I sure. think, I, I got I to ask you this question. It's a totally different subject. But now, in your profile, it says you're from, um, is it Mesquite, Texas? Yes, which is just a suburb of Dallas. Okay, so you, are you born and raised Texas? Born and raised Dallas. Yep, born and raised in Mesquite. So, we uh, in 2019, my wife and I, we were asked to pastor 
a church. We uh, so we started pastoring in 2019, uh-huh. but that same year uh, we were also asked to help open up a drug and alcohol rehab at the same really? pl- time. So really, not only was I a full time pastor, um, I was also full time. I guess there was a job title, so a recovery coordinator, or it would basically be like pastoring these men in the drug rehab. So we opened our our first month. We had five um, five residents. The first, actually, the first, yeah, first month. But before we opened it, I had to go to Texas uh, huh? to Wichita Falls. Texas. Okay, yeah, and, and then I went to Vernon, Vernon, Texas. Yes. So there were two uh, two hope centers that I would go and visit, and I just spent time and, and just basically kind of shadow and see what, how they did their basically their business model, and then we brought right. that to Hawaii. And all all you know, joking aside, uh, my good friend at the time he's he's from Wichita Falls, yes. and I and he was he's a uh, he was a former drug addict. I said when I went to his town and I said, brother, if I was from this town, I'd be a drug addict too. <laughs> so I'm like, what yeah. are you, I'm like, what are you doing yeah. here? Cause there's no ocean. There's no mountains. No. Uh, you no. the waterfall you have. It's fake. Um, you're in the middle of dirt field. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then he told me, <laughs> Oh, it gets better. He says the, the drinking water, uh, we, we were made famous because we figured out how to um, purif- purify sewer water and make it into you know drinkable water. I'm like, dude, that's not a bragging right. I'm sorry, it's, you no, know. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, no. <laughs> w- yeah, Wichita Falls is is, is pretty much um, yeah. It, it, it's it's not a place that you want to really visit as and and like. You don't vacation there yeah, yeah. at all. You know, there's a lot of beautiful places in Texas, but I, Wichita Falls, I, I, I haven't ever, you know, thought about, I've, definitely I've drove through there many times, but I, I've never thought about stopping there for a, for a, for a, you know, vacation or anything like that. But, um, yes. No, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not dissing the town because they're good people, but no, I, no, I did no. go uh, deer hunting. In, in Texas, uh, in Wichita yes. Falls, I went deer hunting. Um, that was fun. Yeah, but yeah, it it's got it's got some good uh, land out there. Like like I said, it, it, but the but if you're looking for vacation activities, it's not the place to go. You know. So I, there's something going on in um, where is Joe Rogan? What what city is he in? Um, so he's in he's in Austin. Yes, Austin. What what's going on in Austin? Like what what is the deal? Is it like another Los Angeles forming? What 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 is it? Austin? It's, Austin is so to to be really honest with you, Austin is a party town. Okay. Austin is the so it it has it has South by Southwest every year, which is a huge music festival and basically what they do is they take about six or eight blocks um and they uh block off the city and then they set up these huge stages stages on each uh street and you have to have an armband that you pay for pre you know pre and and so they'll have some of the biggest names come in they've had you know dave matthews they've had erica badu they've had uh maroon five they've had you know tons and tons of great john mayer uh come through there and basically they they also have a a a street called eighth street and sixth street and it's nothing but a row of bars and clubs literally just one after the other you can walk into one walk in and and there's probably I don't know, probably 16 uh, on each side. And uh, and it's there's a college there. Okay. And so you got college kids mixed with bars, mixed with the yearly South by Southwest. And so it's a really big town for, um, I guess, if, if you're into... Uh, 
trying to uh what's the word uh get people get with people um i can't think of the word right now <laughs> to, to basically mingle to right. uh, uh network to network is what i mean uh that that would be a great place because there's so many people that come there and there's so many people come down there to party and do things like that so i think that's one of the reasons why joe rogan is down there is because there's a lot of people plus elon's here right uh and he has elon on there quite a bit um there's just a lot of people that uh have gotten fed up with california for some reason and and and, and decided to come to texas and you know um none of them have you know right up the street is amazon for me uh the actual factory uh and so there's a amazon factory right up the street from me and texas is a really really big big place you know you can drive two days in texas and still be in texas man you know i drove so in Hawaii, if if I have to drive forty five minutes, we're already uh-huh. contemplating like ah, it's too far. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because here's the scenario in Hawaii. So if you live on the west side of the island and you got to go to work in Honolulu, yeah. you're gonna spend about three to four hours a day driving, God, and wow. it's only it is only a forty five minute drive with no traffic. Yeah. So right. psychologically, it really gets on you because while you're in traffic, you turn your head to the right and you're like, the beach is right there. And you're yeah. sitting in traffic for three hours a day. And uh, so, you know, Hawaii, if, if they say like, uh, you know what, it's too far. But the minute we came to Oregon, bro, to me, three hours is uh, is normal. Like, oh, it's only three hours? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's just wake up early right. and we'll go. Now, I drove from Oregon all the way to Oklahoma City. And yeah. that took me forever because <laughs> I can only drive 10 hours a day and I'm done. Like, let's get right. a hotel and, you know, I, I try a little bit longer, but I, no, it, it's just not safe for me. Um, but beautiful drive, like just the things you see, like you can't get that in Hawaii. Like we drove from here to Boise, Idaho, from Boise, Idaho to Salt Lake City, Utah, and then we slept there. Uh, Salt Lake City, Utah to Colorado Springs. We stayed with my brother and then from Colorado Springs straight to Texas. Uh, pa- we passed through the panhandle. Yes. That yeah. panhandle. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's like, I can't imagine being a cowboy in those days. That's like, right. that's death. Yes. There's, no- I know it. there's nothing for you but strong winds that come out of nowhere. Um, exactly rolling hills yeah i said wow but texas is i I will say uh if texas had an ocean like inland i would be there like i I, we do have we we have uh, galveston which is down south right as far south as you can go so we so we have a, a, a we have a actual ocean at one end of of texas and then at the opposite end of texas it snows that's how big it is is there's a beach where it's sunny quite almost all the time and then at the other end of texas in the panhandle it snows so and i'm in the middle of it i'm right in the middle of all that so i I, we get the mixture of it so but uh that's funny yeah you can drive literally you can drive a day and still be in texas i mean you can you know you have to stop and get a hotel room just to get out if you if you went you know state to state so that that, uh that racetrack going to the dallas Mm -hmm. airport yes oh my god i've never seen that's that's not a racetrack that's like a whole nother county oh yeah because it's got a racetrack and what is like hotels and malls surrounding Mm -hmm. it oh yeah i've never seen texas motor speedway yeah it's huge like what no like it's unbelievable texas is uh I think if if Texas really wanted to, they could say, you know what, we're done with you, federal. We're, yeah. Let's make our own country. Yeah, yeah. They they they, they could. I mean, it, it would be unwise, but we we are big enough, and and I mean, there is there's a lot of uh, revenue and things here. Like 
literally 45 minutes for me is uh AT&T Stadium which is where the Cowboys play yeah and they call that Jerry's World because that place is literally huge I mean you could get lost in that place I bet and I mean it it's one thing to, to to for somebody to go, hey man, that's a big stadium. But then it's another thing when you actually get there and you look like an ant, you know, from above. And then it's got the huge jumbotron that you know is the biggest, I believe, screen in the world or something like that. Uh, but you know, we have that, and then we have uh, you know many of the sports teams that are you know like the rangers and and the the mavericks and stuff like that we have all those things uh, going for us and then you know we have a deal here called the texas militia and it's kind of like what you were talking about a little bit earlier except uh you know they and they they're basically they gear up for civil war or uh if something happens and somebody tries to come in to invade texas or whatever Man, they're ready, and we're talking about guys that literally will take weekends and go off on retreats and just train, you know. And they call it the Texas Militia, and um, you know, it's it's uh, it's something else. But that is a it, it it's it's a and it's not a you know a lot of people label it like a like a white supremacist thing. It's not that. It, it's not that. It's just a group of guys that enjoy guns, enjoy you know going out and, and defending their land and, and doing their thing. And so I haven't seen any harm in it whatsoever. Well, I think that's obviously political, right? When they label people like that. Um, yes. For me, um, if you remember my, my intro uh, where I, one of my, one of my partners is um, five and seven tactical solutions. They, they train for right. firearms, you know, certifications. And that's where I got certified um, but one of the, the things that my friend David P Padilla, so my friend David, he's been a police officer for 20, 20 plus years. His dad was a cop for 20 years before him. He started his own company to help guys, you know, learn how to how, learn how to shoot a weapon, how to fire a weapon and how to handle sure. it safely. And something he mentioned to me when, when we were live together, he said, you know, Greg, it, it's your duty to be able to protect your family. It's not my yes. job. It, it really isn't my job. Now, it, I will do it because that's what I swore. You know, I, I, I got sworn in to defend life and property. And he says, but Correct. as a father, that is your job to protect your family. And right. um, those two minutes that you have to wait for a law enforcement officer to come to your home, that may be the difference between life and death between you and your child or your spouse. Or it sure is. And so I respect people that, you know, and the one thing I like about Texas um, is that they have the uh, stand your uh, the castle doctrine, stand your ground. Stand your ground. I, yeah. I I appreciate that because yeah. I I'm not going to go to your house, Kyle, and, and just walk in your property because there's an understanding. I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't advise it, man. I, I mean, I'm a gun owner, you know, too, I, and I tell people. You know, unless you're coming for dinner and I know about it, you ain't don't don't you know don't come on and don't come to the property because we do have your home is your castle, and literally we we pass laws here. We don't even have to have C C H O. We don't have to have that. Right. We can wear a gun on your hip and it can be out and shown, and you'll see people like the old west literally walking around out here with just guns on their hip, and you know now is it. Is it, you know, is it common for people to go into restaurants and shoot? Stuff? No, not at all. It's it's not, you know, like people think about Texas being tumbleweeds and cowboy hats and guns. It's, it's not like that. But you do have the right to be able to stand your ground and to yeah. be able to protect your, you know, your home. So I, I agree completely. I, I own several firearms myself. So I. I Sarah brought up an interesting point. I'll read. I'll put up on screen. It says sure. that being from Canada, I can't imagine having a gun in my home, and that's respectable. That's I understand sure. that. Um, her family has hunting rifles, but to have a gun, it it is foreign. You know, it is to a lot of people. But one thing I learned about being here in Oregon. So in Hawaii, we don't have what you call red towns or blue towns. 
Hawaii is just, it's an island. There's so many different political views and nobody like pushes it down your throat. Right. But, but I notice here, and it's not bad here, but I do notice that if I go into a town where we live here, it's a small town. It's definitely a red town, right? Right. But nobody is out there with guns in their hips, right? There's nobody with, with rifles in, 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 or gun racks and their rifles hanging in. They have none of that. But yeah. there is an understanding that if you touch my stuff or you, yeah. you perpetrate, yeah. you're going to get shot or potentially. Now, one, uh, one city over, which is 45 minutes, um, in Bend, Oregon, they had a shooting at Safeway. Mm-hmm. And Bend, Oregon is kind of more, and we're not political, but they're more of a like a blue town. Like they're, um, yeah. And I didn't understand this until I moved here, but there are actual towns where people really like, I'm this or I'm this political affiliation, and Bend right. definitely. So they had this guy. He had he had a whole arsenal of weapons. He started yeah. opening fire in a parking lot at Safeway. Um, yes. He ended up shooting one guy. He survived. The butcher, this is, I can't can make this up. The butcher in Safeway grabbed some knives and literally brought a knife to a gunfight. I'm, but you can't make wow. this up. Yeah. Now he ended up dying, which is classic. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight, but right. I think he did save a few lives. Sure. Now, there was a girl who was in and they interviewed her. She had uh she she had a concealed carry in her uh-huh. purse. Her husband didn't have his on him, so she told him, You go to the truck, go get your guns. Yeah. He went to his truck, but by that time they came back into the store, law enforcement already came. Now, however, what Sarah was talking about, she can't imagine um, you know, and having uh, I get that. But I promise you this, if that guy was here in my town, right here. He right. would have been shot in the parking lot. Sure. By at, he would have had at least five to six guys' weapons drawn. Oh, yeah. Um, And it's not that this is the Wild West. It's just that there's an understanding. No, you don't go and take advantage of people. Like, that. the whole thing with Sarah brought is very true because I can't even imagine having a firearm in my home if the culture is like that. Like, in Hawaii, it's mixed but I can't even imagine being in a gunfight and I got to bring a knife that that's yeah. foreign to me. That would be foreign to me that to bring a knife to a gunfight. Right. We had something very similar here where, um, so a guy got out of a car was brandishing an AR and then had a, a bag in his hand and was heading into a art, uh, gallery and was obviously going to shoot it up. They called the police and some guy that was in the parking lot that was going into it had a gun on him pulled it out told the guy put the gun down the guy turned around to put it on him he took care of him and the police got there like 10 minutes later wow. so can you imagine they opened that bag up and there was nothing but just gun after gun and they said if he would have gotten in that gallery that he could have killed countless of people but because that one guy, you know, stepped up and, and did what he had to do. He didn't kill anybody. No, nobody died that day except for the shooter, obviously. But you know what I mean? And I'm not condoning violence, but yeah. I'm condoning self-defense because yeah. that wasn't, you know, you know, that he didn't have good intentions bringing in all those guns. Let's, let's say that, you know, yeah. to the, to the art gallery, he wouldn't, he wasn't there to, to show his guns off. You know? <laughs> so, well, you know, I, 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 I understand what you mean. What are your, um, what do you see as far as the state of Texas, the climate? And we're not just talking about firearms, but we're not just talking about, you know, violence, but it, starting with the Dallas area. And then of course, we're talking about Austin. Sure. And we're going to keep it spiritual, but, what do you see God doing in your home state of Texas? I, I'm curious about that. So we have a a very it, it's it, it's um it can be frustrating at times because let me give you an example. So our governor 
is in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Okay. He was in a car accident and was wheelchair bound and he sued the the state and then he's this is before he became governor he, he stu- sued the state and sued the person and, and he won on millions upon millions and millions of dollars he has now passed a law that the maximum amount that you can be rewarded by anything is two hundred thousand dollars so if you wow. file a claim here yeah so so say you know i get my you know i go in for a surgery to get my tonsils removed and they remove my arm uh the most i can get out of that suit is two two hundred thousand dollars and he put it you know a cap on that so there's a lot of people that are not you know very happy with that uh i uh, th- you know another thing which you know uh there's people that struggle with it all the time and it's porn uh but i don't know if you read about this but porn has now been banned in texas how so, they how they do that they, 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 wow i have no idea they so it, i read about this and i thought sure you know yeah right how you gonna how you gonna do that you know and and so i started reading about it and then i saw they passed the 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 law on it and then i asked a friend about it and they were like no dude really like you can type whatever you want into the phone or other computer or whatever and it will pop up a message that says uh your legislature has voted to not have this uh we're working to reverse it and all this stuff because it takes away your rights blah 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 blah. so uh you know there's things like that that you know Probably, you know, there's some definitely some things that need to be, uh, you know, taken down like that. You know, uh, it it may do some good with people that are addicted to porn and and things like that to to not be able to access that. But I mean, you you cannot access it at all whatsoever. Uh, any of the explicit sites, um, and I think that they're doing that to try to set a precedent for you know, other states to do it, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that are not happy about it, you know, and uh, to me, I don't struggle with that, so it's it's not something that's concerning to me or anything, but uh, like I said, you know, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of power plays that Texas does, and like I said, capping it to 200,000, you know, banning porn, uh, about four years ago or so or three years ago we had a really bad snowstorm that came through right and it lasted for like a week or so which is rare in in dallas and east texas and uh they literally shut our power off and because they wanted to save energy so that meant no heating that meant you couldn't have any electricity you couldn't light a room up and i remember literally it was at, in the it was like one degree or minus a degree at that time and i remember literally being under three to four blankets in a hoodie with sweats with every, and still shaking and they would turn it on for 45 minutes you know and that would be your time to run to the bathroom to run to the kitchen to grab something, you know, do whatever you need to do. And they, they'd shut it off. And they did this for like five days straight. And I, I can tell you, man, <laughs> if, if that, that, that was, that was some hell right there. If you <laughs> want to talk about it. it, just being so cold that you go, man, I got to go to the bathroom. And then you pull the cover off and go, not that bad. Not, not I don't have to go to the bathroom that bad. <laughs> it's so cold, man. You know, but, uh, like I said, I, there's, I believe that God is in control and I believe that no matter who's voted in the office, no matter mm-hmm. what happens, what goes on, I believe that, that God is going to still be on the throne yep. and still be in control. And, and I think that we get too caught up in who are we going to vote for? Who are we going to back? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing... 
and we need to, to remember that that it's not political and the president that's in control that god is the one that's really in control if we if we're being honest about it because uh, there's not a man on this earth that can save your soul or, you know, set you in the right direction or set you up. You know, you brought up some key points, um, especially in the area of Texas. And the, the, I love, first of all, I love the fact that they banned porn. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, completely. Uh, yeah. I will say now, and uh, some people know this, Some uh, probably most don't, but like for me and my wife, pornography was an issue in our marriage. And that's something that I had to really be willing to walk through. Now, I never had issues with drugs or like I never they didn't do crystal meth. I never smoked weed, even though I'm from Hawaii. I never had any of those issues, but right. it was always those closet things that, you know, sure. and the fact that, um, you know, my wife and I now we're, we're about to do some marriage conferences and, and God's opening doors for us and you know, having four kids and there are things that the enemy will use in, in our past to say that's who we are, to identify, no, this is what you are. This is, and coming to terms is, no, 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 there's a reason why there's a, a cross. There's a reason why there's a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that I'm forgiven. And all of those past histories of me are, they're, they're a null, they're, they're, they're void. Um, but when I see, when you talk about Texas, I'm like, there's a battle in our nation when it comes to righteousness yes. right and yes. even though texas has got obviously their pluses and minuses the fact that there are some righteous uh legislation going on what i do believe kyle is that there are there's a righteous remnant in the state of texas that are are pushing these things through first of all through prayer uh, yes. We do have a good, uh, so we're, my wife and I are prayer leaders for, uh, it's a prayer network based out in Oklahoma City. And uh, we'll be right. we'll be in that area actually in October. Um, nice. But I'll, I'll lead in with this is, uh, man, you you hit it on the money. Like we're building our kingdoms, we're establishing our governments, but there's only one kingdom that really stands above it all, right? And that's, that's God. That's right. And yeah. For some reason, in America, we forget that there's a history book that shows all the other fallen kingdoms that came before us. And for some reason, we don't think that that's possible yeah. for us. <laughs> you know what I right, mean? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. We're so naive and in that. Yeah, I think it's it's what you said. It's maturity and it's immaturity. It, it It's people, like I said, that, you know, that will say things like what is what has god ever done for me that i haven't done for myself man you know if if you break that statement down that is really deep because uh buddy you're not taking your next breath you're not taking your next heartbeat heartbeat by thought you're not thinking about those things that's just you know that that's god and um i you know a lot of times his ways are not our ways, but, but his ways are always the best ways is what I would say, you know, Amen and I would much rather, I'd, I'd much rather put my faith and trust in him than I would in society and man. And, and, and you know what, let's be real. There's a lot of mockers, scoffers, people that make fun or, or want to, uh, you know, talk bad about christians and and our belief and stuff like that but my, my brother used to say i'd rather be justified by god than be exalted and justified by man yep. and that's kind of the belief that i've i've always lived by is I, I care more about what god has for me and says than i do that man has for me and says i think it's uh psalm 139 where you know when David the psalmist writes that even before I was born you knew me you you yes. wonderfully and craftily created everything about me all my inward parts all of my everything right and it it, it alludes to without you can make an amazing movie just on the scripture that, that even before that God entrusted us to this human family 
to steward this this child. God already had the blueprint and a DNA already written. That's and, right. And, and it's and he identified us through that and, and everything about us he already he wrote the, the code for it and yeah and my friend, let me pull up this comment i'm glad i saw it sarah wrote it's like that song he knows my name very much so very much so very yeah. very popular guy out of texas sang a song brother brother israel yeah. hofton yeah yeah he knows my yeah. name. but um, oh yeah I think we're going to have to land the plane in about a few minutes. So I want to give you an opportunity. Um, what I typically do, uh, Kyle, I, I do rapid fire questions to kind of land yeah. the plane, but I want to give you an opportunity Sounds to good. share something on your heart before we do the rapid fire. Okay, sure. So um, I would encourage people that when I was younger, I had a totally different vision of me at 45. I had a vision of, uh, you know, being a, a, a celebrity bass player, or guitar player, musician, and, uh, and just being out there. And, and it, it took me a while to learn, but something that I heard a very wise man say one time is we're not, physical beings that are going through a spiritual experience we're spiritual beings having a physical experience that means that we are you know the bible says that that our life physically here on this earth is like a breath like a vapor it's just this one and it disappears and there's a lot of people that live out there and they live off their riches and their gold and things like that. And they, they say, what is God not, you know, what is God to me? I, I, I've made all my successes. And I would encourage people to remember that make that decision before it's too late and make that decision now to live for God. And I don't mean... Uh, uh, any other God that has been listed uh, uh, or made up, I mean, Jesus Christ. And I would encourage people that the time wouldn't be tomorrow because we're not at promise tomorrow. And I've seen that firsthand, unfortunately. But you know what? To, to right now is the best time. And, and to be able to understand, again, this life is just a breath we're not we're not you know spiritual beings having a fear we, we, we are physical beings just having just you know here for a little bit we're spiritual beings in reality so i would encourage people to to get as close to god as they can well thank you for sharing that brother and truly heartfelt and i'm, I'm glad we did this i'm glad that you shared a little bit about the chapters that you had to endure and I'm encouraged that, and I'm not conflicting what you shared earlier. I do know that God, uh, you know, I grew up with this God is in control. I And I also, uh, I, I reshaped part of my personal, uh, not theology, but uh, interpretation that God is very much so in charge in my life. Sure. But I, I do believe that he's also giving me the pen and he's given us oh, the, the pen, yeah. right to write out some chapters um yeah and i'm grateful that that we can do these things where we can go live on social media we can do conversations sure. and just encourage people so i want to say thank you and then uh let's do a yeah. rapid fire and then uh, yeah. let's land Sounds the plane so question number one there's no right or wrong answers. And if it's a question that you think you shouldn't answer, you can just say, hey, man, I don't think I should answer. <laughs> so question number one, <laughs> why right. did you do this live stream with me today? Um, I think it's been a long time coming. I, I, we've we've talked, uh, we've crossed over, you know, each other for many, many years. We've we've said, hey, man, we need we need to get together and do something. We do. You know, we kicked around ideas and times and and, you know, things have happened and I, and I, and man, I, I just, it, it was a great night. It was a great time. And I'm glad that we were able to get together 
And to be honest, I really look forward to doing some even more stuff with you. And, you know, I think that we have a whole lot more in common than we do than un in common. And I really enjoyed, uh, you know, coming on and being on tonight. You and I, I really uh, we we're asked to go on to American Idol. I play the drums yeah. and you play the bass. What song are we playing? Uh, let's see. That's a good one. Uh, let's play Uptown Funk by uh, uh, Bruno Mars. <laughs> okay. No, I'm going to need some practice. Let's play Bruno. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Question number right. three. Who's more legit? The Kyle Mack or Toby Mack? Oh, uh, let's see. I'm going to have to go with MC Hammer because he's too legit <laughs> to quit, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question number four. Will DC Talk ever have a reunion? Oh, I don't think so. I think there's too much bad blood. Uh, I I think there's some bad blood there, but there's some there's some, some stories there. So I, I, I'm not sure they're, they'll ever have a true true blue reunion uh may, maybe a, maybe a concert but not a reunion so texas barbecue or south carolina barbecue texas barbecue by the way all, all the way i've i've been to the carolinas I've, I've been there and i've had their barbecue and and there's nothing better than texas barbecue you don't like that mustard that mustard binder <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, man, no, 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 no. Okay, question number six. Here we go. Uh, yes, a big fat ninety-six ouncer from I think is a Roadhouse in Texas. I've, the famous steak, yes, word, or uh, a five marbling score of twelve Japanese wagyu cooked by the finest chef in Japan. I'm gonna so because I've never had the the one in Japan, I would probably want to try that because I have actually tried the Texas Roadhouse one and I know what that's like. So I would I would be open to, to seeing what that's like. Okay. So being from Texas, is it crawfish or crayfish or crawdad? Uh so it's two different things so if you're putting it in if, if, if you're putting it into uh like gumbo it's crawfish uh if it's actually still alive and still in the water it's crawdad so it's two different things so if, if it's if it's going to be in, if it's if it's actually in the the cooked and dead and already in the the gumbo, it, it's crawfish, and then if it's something that's in the water, the skimming around, it's crawdad, uh, is the way we say it here. Real quick before question number eight, Dr. John, we see you. He's on YouTube. Thank you for being here. Question number eight. Yeah. If I drive 95 miles an hour, is that fast enough in Texas? Probably, you're probably about right there. You're probably about right there, except for a few people with motorcycles that are gonna that are gonna pass you up, or unless the bars are letting out and they're really <laughs> all over the road. So, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, ninety five is 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 pretty good here. So, yeah, you're about right. Sarah put ninety five question mark. Sarah, they drive fast, and and Texas has a lot of long straightaways, so it's kind of okay wow. to go eighty. Actually, eighty is like acceptable because of the speed it's, limit. Yeah. Yeah, you you can get eighty five and not get ticketed. So now <clears throat> we're almost we're almost here landing the plane. So no. money finance is not an issue. Where yes. would you like to take yourself and your family? Oh, uh, probably somewhere like Colorado, uh, mountain, snow, um, cabin that kind of a area lake a lot of greenery rolling hills uh but more of the colder climate because we have the rolling hills here in in texas and the panhandle and all that but somewhere uh cold somewhere where you can kind of camp and stuff like that but have a cabin to go to at night and uh just hang out and uh, spend time being a family okay 
Last and final question. I ask this on every live stream, podcast, or whatever interview I do. What is sure. your desire for the next generation after us? So that's a really great question. My desire to, for the next generation is for them to not get caught up in what the fad or what the um, the agenda or the cool thing is going on right now is don't allow your focus to be pulled to one side. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the Tide Pod challenges and stuff that people died over because they wanted to be recognized. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be stars on TikTok, you know, so they would eat it. A, a, a Tide Pod, uh, but going even further than that, just that that our generation would turn their eyes more to God than to each other or to man and woman, uh, and see the difference. Because, like I said before, that God is the one that's in control; man is the one that thinks he's in control. And so, I would I would love for the next generation to have you know. They, someone said, you know, with, with all the things that are coming back in stock, I can't wait for integrity, uh, strength, and uh, for lovingness to come back into style, you know, and I, and I agree with that, you know, I think we've uh, kind of lost our integrity, so I would love to see integrity come back into style, uh, of course, that's, you know, integrity is, is doing the right thing thing even when no one's looking and i and i guess i'll end my rant on that is that i, I hope that the the younger generation will look to god and not to man i i'm on board with that I, you know my my desire is to when i'm gone i'm hoping that what i leave behind is generational um right and multifaceted it's not about money or now I do obviously want to leave something for my kids to where they don't have to struggle financially to be in their calling in life. Finances should never yep. be a deciding factor of who they become. Um, the other thing is I'm on board with that. Like people, their identity falls in the wrong things. And it, it hurts for me to see that because I've been through that. I'm sure you've been through a lot of that. And so I'm on board okay. with that. And man, I will say this, man, it's been, it's been fun. I, I, I wish I could do more, um, but I got to go get some ice cream, ice cream <laughs> yeah. for, for my son. Uh, and then some sparkling, um, we got to get our sparkling water. There's a sparkling water that oh, like, I, it's called Gerald Steiner. It's from Germany. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Right. So, but uh, you know, I, I we're going to do this again. And I'll say this, anybody that doesn't Please know do. who Kyle is, his username is it the same on all social media outlets? Or is it? The Kyle Mac. Okay. So it's the Kyle Mac. Since we're live here on, on X, Twitter, it's the, the Kyle Mac. Don't use that name because it is trademark. True story. It, <laughs> if you want to yes. connect with him, and I hope this is still active, it's beacons.ai slash the Kyle Mac. That's how you can kind of connect with him. Yeah. And he's a Christ follower. Um I love him other than the fact that he, he does say he's a Dallas Cowboy fan. So other than that, he's a good guy. Oh. My wife my wife is doing a <laughs> – <laughs> it's like whatever. I, I'm just, oh, I, I don't, all right. I'm just kidding. I, I don't even care about football too much. Yeah. But, Kyle, you are the man. Thank you, brother. Um, hey, man, thank you. What so I'm going to do is – It's been my honor. Please. We're going to do our fancy video outro once the live ends – We'll be in the green room, and I just want to do my official goodbye. So just hang on for a second, okay? Sure, absolutely. Family, I just want to say um, we really appreciate you being here. And uh, if you don't know who I am, obviously it's it's all in the profile descriptions and all that. But I, I, I enjoy doing these a lot, and I'm hoping that you enjoyed it as well. And so if you missed the emotional heavy content, when I end the broadcast – Go to the very beginning within the first 30 to 45 minutes, you're going to hear his story on the chapters that he had to write out for himself that were extremely challenging. So I'm very blessed to have had Kyle in here. So be sure to share this out. 
love on each other family and as i always say thank you for your time thank you for tapping the screen for the hearts all that good stuff but most importantly family thank you for your time above everything else i appreciate you guys until next time as i always say love you guys god bless you guys ahui ho aloha and mahalo yes sir Chew.